There are three major challenges the geologist faces when trying to decipher and then actually record what is in the subsurface. Let me explain these challenges in more detail. The first challenge for the geologist is being able to accurately account for the time lag between the time when the cuttings were cut to the time that it took for them to reach the surface. The second challenge for the geologist is to be able to recognize and correctly place the different cuttings in the correct zone. For example, because not all cuttings rise to the surface at the same rate, large, low-density cuttings can rise faster than small, high-density ones. In addition, particles from redrilled portions of the well may have fallen into the hole because of clay swelling or may have sloughed off from the formations further up in the hole and can become mixed with other samples of cuttings deeper in the hole. Having to decide, therefore, the correct order of the cuttings or having to recognize and discard material that has been seen previously requires a lot of experience. Fortunately, the experienced site geologist is more likely to place all of these sometimes random cuttings into the stratigraphic column in the log properly. His third challenge is to be on the lookout for disintegration. Disintegration is caused when the drill bit grinds up the cuttings into such fine particles that these particles dissolve into the water of the drilling mud. They literally disappear and cause a blank space on the log. The geologist must, therefore, be on the alert for disintegration so that he can use other tests to identify the type of rock that is in the formation but may be missing on the log. In any event, using the correlated data coupled with interpretative experience, the geologist prepares the report of the stratigraphic descriptions of the borehole from top to bottom. With the compiled data on the mud log from the driller, the mud logger, and the geologist, the drilling department is able to determine the depth of the well, calculate the different drilling zones as measured by the rate per hour the drill bit passed through the various rock types, check for oil and gas shows in the mud, collect and analyze the cuttings for their characteristics and lithology, and place the cuttings at their appropriate placement as they might appear on the stratigraphic column. These formation evaluation techniques, however, give them only a partial interpretive view of what is there in the subsurface. For instance, when the driller notices a jump or break on the drilling log, he performs a bottoms-up circulation. This break in the mud log may be the first indication of a reservoir rock with good porosity. This preliminary data from the mud log can only suggest the potential of a reservoir. Procedures and tests to collect actual samples and test for formation characteristics and fluid pressures and volumes will have to be conducted. Remember, conducting the following series of procedures is so important, in fact, that the Society of Petroleum Engineers requires that when a company claims it has found a new oil or gas reserve, actual production and formation tests under SPE best practices must be conducted. Please refer to Chapter 5 for more information about proven and unproven oil and gas reserves. With that said, let's go back to the logger. When performing a bottoms-up circulation, he will have communicated this maneuver to the site geologist. If the geologist's analysis of the bottoms-up circulation is favorable, he may call for the capture of an actual sample of the subsurface rock. Called coring, the sampling method 
allows him to collect an actual example that can be picked up, examined in detail, smelled, weighed, and analyzed for key reservoir parameters. These samples will then be sent to the company's laboratories for further analysis. Since two round trips are required to first install the coring assembly and then to remove it, coring is not cheap in time or money. Not only is additional time needed for these round trips, the core bit or core barrel drills at a much slower rate than a conventional drill bit. When the geologist thinks that there is enough justification to core, however, he instructs the driller to trip out and prepare for coring. As you can imagine, the geologist who delays drilling to core potential pay zones can be under a lot of pressure from the drilling department to resume drilling as fast as possible. The onus is, therefore, on the geologist to core sparingly, yet appropriately, something not always easy to distinguish when faced with incomplete information. In conventional coring, the drill string is pulled out of the hole and the drill bit is replaced with a conventional core assembly that consists of a donut-shaped diamond or PDC bit that runs on a hollow core barrel. This string is then run back to the bottom where rotation and mud circulation is restarted. As the bit penetrates the rock face, a solid core of undrilled, uncrushed rock rises through its center into the barrel. When the zone of interest has been penetrated or when the core barrel is full with a sample of about 30 feet long, the string with the barrel that contains the core is pulled up to the surface with the spring-loaded core catcher attached. Once the core is retrieved, it is taken to the laboratories for core analysis. Whole core analysis is sometimes performed, but usually only a small section of the core called a plug analysis is done. In this analysis, the laboratory checks the core sample for porosity, fluid saturations, permeability, lithology, and other areas of interest as requested. Conventional coring does not work in every formation. It works best in consolidated, hard reservoir rocks that are more frequently found in older onshore formations. For softer, unconsolidated formations where conditions for conventional coring are not suitable, sidewall coring is sometimes performed instead. Conducted after coring would have been completed, Sidewall coring is usually done at the same time as open hole logging, and like the open hole logging suite, it is run on a wire line. During the procedure, sidewall cores are taken from the side of open hole wells by shooting exploding small cylindrical bullets into the formation with a sidewall gun. These cylinders capture formation material. Because the cylinders are on wire tethers, they can be brought to the surface at the time the gun is retrieved. Although a much cheaper alternative to conventional coring, sidewall coring is less informative than conventional cores. For example, measurements for porosity and permeability can be compromised in sidewall testing because the impact of the fired cylinders can cause crushing and compaction. The main use of sidewall coring, however, is not to replace conventional coring, but to supplement the data retrieved to the open hole logging suite. It is an excellent tool because it very accurately determines lithology or rock type. By checking specific spots, especially regarding lithology and fluid saturation, the geologist can get a clearer picture than is visible on the mud log. There are several types of production tests that can be performed, but here we will limit our discussion to the three main ones. They are number one, the drill stem test, DST, number two, the wireline formation test, WFT, and three, the initial potential test, or IP. 
As I said before, the DST and WFT are both performed in open holes, while the IP is done in cased holes. First, drill stem tests measure fluid flow and reservoir pressure. Let me explain the steps involved in a drill stem test. It begins when the drill bit or bottom hole assembly, the BHA, is pulled out and replaced with the DST, which consists of one, two or more valves, two, a packer or packers to form a seal between the drill pipe and the open hole, and three, a pressure recorder. The DST is lowered to the zone of interest. The packer or packers are set. Then the first valve is opened to expose the pressure recorder to the reservoir where it records the formation pressure. Then the second valve is opened to allow the formation fluid to flow to the surface. Its flow rate is measured along with the saturation percentages. Samples are collected and sent to the lab for further analysis. This part of the test establishes whether oil, gas, or water will flow to or near the surface and in what percentage. Of course, the worst case scenario is when the producing fluid is only salt water. After a short period of time, the second valve is then closed and a second pressure measurement is recorded. Here, having the rate of pressure buildup go back to the initial reservoir pressure is more important than the pressure itself because a rapid buildup shows that the reservoir's influx quickly replaced the fluids removed during the drill stem flow test. A rapid buildup and return to the initial formation pressure will most likely demonstrate high permeability and a high accumulation of hydrocarbons which are important indicators of the commercial quantity of the reservoir. If, however, the final pressure does not return to the initial pressure level, this could indicate that the pressure in the zone has been depleted or partially depleted and will probably not be able to sustain a necessary pressure over a period of time demonstrating that this zone will most likely be ignored for further analysis. Once the testing is complete, the packer is released and the BHA is pulled out. As the string is pulled out, each stand is checked for water and oil. The number of stands that contains oil or salt water is also recorded and becomes another method of evaluating the formation. Like all tests, there can be challenges when performing a DST. For example, it can often be difficult to get a good packer seating because of the irregularity of the sides of the hole. Without a good seating, the test may fail. This is especially risky if the formation to be tested has been completely drilled through. Packers set in tandem, one above the other, may be used to rectify this problem. The best solution, though, is prevention. It requires the site geologist to stop the bit's penetration before the zone is completely penetrated. Let me say one last thing about DSTs. Usually run in open hole wells for a variety of reasons. They can also be run in holes that have been drilled to TD or total depth, cased, cemented, and then perforated. Doing a DST at this time can avoid packer seating problems and the possibility of getting stuck that is always present in open hole wells. In addition, because higher quality test results can be obtained when performed in cased holes, it is sometimes more advantageous to wait until the hole has been cased even with the added costs of casing, cementing, and perforating, especially if the formations look really promising. We'll talk more about this in Chapter 8.